Well, hello, I'm here with Gaurav Seth, and it you're is. working on the JavaScript engine of Edge called Chakra. That is correct. So, what is your main role there? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, you know, I'm actually one of the program managers on the Chakra team. Uh, you know, uh, I'm actually looking at all the aspects around, you know, how do we improve the performance of Chakra, how do we make sure that it is both interoperable and, com you know, back compatible in places where it is needed, how do we make sure that it works really, really well with Microsoft Edge and some of the other products where, you know, the JavaScript engine is currently embedded. So, I mean, all in all, I think I'm actually overlooking the entire, uh, you know, PM team at uh, Chakra, but, you know, I'm kind of into almost every piece a little bit here and there. So when it comes to server-side JavaScript, V8 seems to be like, together with Node, seems to be the dominant player right now. Do you think there is an opportunity, or do, should people think of about more engines, or is it okay to just think about one of them? Because on, on the web, I always had to think of our, our browsers. Right. But it seems like there's a, there's a monopoly going on right now. Right, I think it's, it's a great question. And uh, you know, just for context, in the last six months or so, uh, you know, one of the things that we did was we did add support for Chakra with Node, uh, specifically looking at, uh, you know, Windows IoT. Now, Windows IoT as a SKU and as a platform, there were certain differences or issues that, you know, the stock V8 cannot actually run today uh, on that platform. And we wanted to bring the power of Node to actually go to all platforms because I think what we believe in is, you know, Cooperation is good, and that's what I would say that you know we we were looking at at that point in time. And to answer your specific question, I think, you know, of course there are going to be tons and tons of hardware profiles that are going to be available uh, over a period of time. Like with IoT coming in, there is of course the server payloads. There's the host of OSs that we work on. Each JavaScript engine optimizes for a little different things, and in the end, I think having, uh, you know, having choices for developers to make, I think is going to be great for the ecosystem overall, and is something that, you know, we hope will happen in the, you know, over a period of time. The big danger or the big scare that people have is then they have to write for different engines. So how does it work with interoperability? How do you deal with, are you in communication all the time with other browser makers, with other engine makers, and right. how is it standardized? So that, that is a great question. I mean, if you look at, uh, you know, if I just step out and just take a look at browsers, right? I mean, all browsers are running JavaScript engines. Developers write the code once, it runs across all browsers. And so we have to say, solve the same problems even for the browsers. And one of the things that happens there is we, engage and interact very, very closely with all these other, uh, you know, VM makers as well. For example, we're working with the V8 team in Google. We work with, you know, folks from Mozilla uh, about how do we implement, uh, you know, the JavaScript engines and how do we really go and make it interoperable. One of the places I would say that, you know, where we interact the most here is the way the language specification is built. Like we all are part of TC39 as part of the, you know, ECMA committee. Uh, ECMA is actually, uh, you know, the committee that standardizes this language. It's officially called ECMAScript. So we all work together, you know, we all get into a room and it's not only these browser vendors that get in, are part of that committee, but it's even like, you know, top uh, framework authors, top web properties. So people have representations and we work through all, a mix of all of that, you know, when we are thinking about problems, hey, what would be, you know, both backward compatible for the web, plus we can actually bring in some of the new, uh, you know, functionalities and, uh, you know, new concepts to the language over a period of time without breaking the web, because web is a pretty complex problem. And so, you know, if you can think of the web, you know, and we are all working together to make sure that the web remains interoperable. Uh, you know, it's the same concept, just goes anywhere uh, uh, traditionally. Now, there are certain nuances, like, you know, uh, if you look at a particular host, and when you say, when I say a host, it essentially means like, hey, the browser is the one that is embedding the, you know, VM, or Node is the host that is embedding the VM. There are specific nuances regarding to those hosts, but I think those can pretty well be shimmed out from the developers. But that said, there are certain things, for example, you know, if you would want 100% uh, compatibility in Node, you know, the, the ideal thing there is to, you know, work together with, you know, the Node Foundation, with the other VM vendors, et cetera, to be able to standardize, you know, an ABI layer, for example, between Node and the JavaScript VMs, where, uh, you know, 
each VM can play interoperably well so that developers have a great experience using the end-to-end -end product. I think the goal really is developers sh should be able to use the end-to-end -end product without worrying about interoperability uh, you know, uh, across one VM or the choice of another VM. How do we break the concept of the conundrum of ES6, as I call it? We have ES6, but people can't use it in the wild, so they use transpilers or they use things like TypeScript, they use things like CoffeeScript, mm -hmm. they use other languages to convert into JavaScript. Right. Now, in an environment like an IoT device with like not lots of RAM, this is just not on. This will not happen. So, right. how we, how can we get people to write more bare bones ES6 uh, um, language itself without you can, without jumping through hoops to convert it to older ones for older browsers, or is this just a dream that's not possible that easily? Right. Uh, so no, great question. I think the, the real thing here is it's definitely a very tough problem, but one of the things I would say, especially given that you asked me specifically about IoT first, is you know IoT is still a very emerging field. And if what happens is if all of the JavaScript implementations that come to the IoT space bring a richer set of you know ES6 or the newest language support already baked in, you know, developers would have the flexibility that they do not need to use a transpiler and all of those features are available already on those IoT devices. Now in a browser world, of course, it's a very different problem because there is a very different set of customers you're targeting. You know, there's always the enterprise customers, there's always the consumer segment, etc. You know, on the enterprise, you have to take care of the compatibility concerns, etc. But on, on at least on the consumer side, the good news is that with all of the browsers becoming this evergreen browser and then they updating very quickly, uh, I hope that you know, the problem of using transpilers and you know, serving your large user base is going to reduce over a period of time. Though, you know, I would caveat that I don't see that problem going away completely anytime soon because you know, just, it's, it's just the dynamics of you know, how the market plays right now. If we look at ES6 now in terms of speed comparison, it's actually much slower than ES5, which is it's obvious because it's a more complex That's language. Correct. But um, to make that better, we need people to use it in the browser to test against. Great. So uh, what could we do? How could people help with that? Uh, you know, the only thing I would suggest is people should start using some of those constructs because, you know, all the browser vendors typically these days look for patterns like, you know, when anything goes through my engine, it's like a chicken and egg problem. Like, hey, we have this functionality, our developers using it. If they're using it, we will make sure that we go and optimize it, right? Because we see that pattern coming to us more and more. You know, we go scout the web to figure out what patterns people are using, etc. And when we do that, as part of that, if we don't see that people are using a lot of ES6 constructs, we might prioritize something that is a, a lot more used and go optimize that rather than you know spending the time to just go optimize some of the ES6 constructs. So the real thing here is I think you know as developers, if people could uh, you know as developers could start actually using ES6 in these new language constructs, I'm sure like you know all of the JavaScript VM makers one by one will start optimizing those patterns because you know at the end of the day it's all about prioritizing where do you want to invest and how do you you know give the maximum performance to your users and your to your developers that's a big stalemate that we have haven't we like developers saying oh browsers don't have that yet so i can't use it correct. and browsers say people don't use it so i so i'm not going to implement it correct so and and that's why i'm not so so we we are breaking uh, breaking away from at least that conundrum because i'm not saying that we will not implement it like i think all browsers for example uh, have now moved to this uh, idea that we need to support those features uh, you know one of the things that's happening in uh, ECMAScript, which is the official name of JavaScript and its evolution going ahead is, you know, as we go and standardize more and more features in JavaScript, we want to have at least two implementations out there so that we can vet it out whether it will actually break the web or not. And the reason I bring this is because if you think of it, this is also kind of a forcing function for all you know, browser makers, JavaScript VM implementers to make sure that you're giving that functionality out for developers to try it and play with it. And my hope is you know, once we start adding functionality that is really compelling, developers will code against it and then you know, we will start optimizing some of those things. It's not to say that we don't optimize anything, you know, till developers start using this, of course, there are some of those features where you see, hey, you know, I think this will be a very useful feature, uh, and developers would love to, uh, you know, use this particular feature. So we actually would, as a part of just implementing it initially, you know, even though the MVP might just be that, hey, you support that functionality, the MVP might actually be a little bit more where that you need to meet certain performance criteria. 
In terms of reaching out to developers, what's the easiest way to reach your team? Do you have an own instance? Are you, uh, do you have GitHub repositories? Where can you complain about Chakra and where can you help Chakra? So right now, I think all our instances are tied with uh, you know, Microsoft Edge. You can always reach out to my, you know, at MS Edge Dev uh, on our Twitter account. You can use the Edge user voice. Uh, you know, we are, think of us as a small sub team in that larger team. And we work, uh, you know, we are part of the web platform. We all look at it. If there is uh, information that is available to us that gets routed to us. But one of the things that we are going to announce soon is that we are thinking about open sourcing the Chakra engine. Uh, what do you think is the, uh, what I found interesting when I looked at what you did with Chakra is that a few of the, uh, the optimizations of the engine were because developers did things wrong. Mm -hmm. Which were the things that you, you found are, uh, are incompatible or, or like unoptimized ways of coding that you had to make uh, the engine do for developers to make the work better? And which are the things you would love developers to, to do so you don't have to do that again? Right, I mean, there are, there are certain best practices and you know, we've been talking about them uh, often when we go to conferences as part of blogs, et cetera. There are a couple that I will call out here. You know, one of the patterns that we looked at was, uh, you know, People tend to use, like if you're operating on an array, uh, in, um, in a for loop, for example, you'll tend to use like, hey, uh, go repeat this action till dot length of this array. Uh, what people don't realize is that, you know, you are actually accessing that property, uh, you know, the length property of the array again and again, so you're making the engines do work. And there are similar patterns that can happen. Now, one of the things that we did uh, in the last release with Chakra was we actually went and optimized it. You know, we kind of, uh, the length load uh, operation, we eliminated the cost that the engine has to pay. You know, in terms of accessing that property, we kind of treat it as a constant. But that's a great example of like, you know, as a developer, you can think, hey, am I actually making the engine go do more work? You know, one other example could be as, you know, people minify code you know, uh, try to see what is the implication of the minification that you're getting from a performance perspective. Like, you know, always have that, th there's always a trade-off. There's definitely, you know, you do want to minify code. You don't want to send like unminified code to clients, but, you know, try to see what kind of patterns, you know, some of the minifiers are exhibiting out there, which, ones, which one does a good job, which one does not. I mean, I would not try to recommend a particular thing. For example, we were looking at, you know, some of the patterns a while back, uh, and it so happened that, you know, what we found was a lot of the web was using Uglify.js, and, uh, you know, when we ran a set of benchmarks, you know, that were minified using that, we found that there were certain issues or lackings in the engine that we could actually fix. Uh, to make sure that you know all code that is minified using uh, that particular minifier, Uglify JS, could run anywhere up to 50% faster uh, in Chakra. I mean that's just one example. There are, there are more such minifiers that we keep looking at. There are more code patterns because at the end of the day, our job really is to make sure that we are looking at patterns from the web and making sure whatever patterns we see the most, we go optimize that because. You know, as I was uh, referring to earlier, performance is all about figuring out where those bottlenecks are and where you can have the most impact to the widest set of audience. Well, we could talk for hours, but we're kind of out of time. One last thing, if you were to look into your orb of the future, how far away are we from multi-threaded JavaScript? Interesting question, great question. I would say uh, it's not, too far off, I think the reason I say that is, you know, web, uh, the ASM.js as a technology in JavaScript has started thinking about the problems that come with multi-threaded JavaScript. You know, you typically take a C++ code, you transpile it down to JavaScript, and then many of the times what you see is the C++ code is multi-threaded. So, you know, we got to solve this problem, and I'm hopeful that within the next year or so, we would at least start seeing uh, you know, browser vendors discussing actively as to how do we support multi-threaded JavaScript. Now, the other thing about multi-threaded JavaScript is of course like how engines are taking uh, you know, advantage of the underlying hardware it is running it, which already exists today. But I'm actually talking about like, you know, the act from an execution perspective, like as developers, how you can write code uh, from a multi-threaded perspective. And I would think that you know, there are things that are emerging. There's, of course, WebAssembly that is emerging, which is going to be, I think, a step ahead of ASM.js. You know, and we are starting to look at that subset of problems that ASM.js solves. And multi-threading is definitely a problem there. So I'm hopeful that at least in the next year or so, we would have some proposals coming out in this area to see how do we solve that problem. 
Excellent. So JavaScript is going leaps and bounds and Chakra is going open source. And I hope you will be there, file issues, file bugs and help us make that engine as good as the others and if not better. Yes, thanks thank very you. much. Thanks, thanks Chris.